by debut author Erin Yoon. Erin's Pippa Park Raises Her Game is available for purchase at a Likely Story bookstore, and you can also check it out from the library. You can even check it out from Hoopla. Oops, which it's available right there for free and instantly. Here are some fun fast facts about Erin. She is obsessed with personality quizzes and takes them for her characters. She is half Korean and half Polish Germanic. Her favorite foods include kimchi, jjigae, cherry ice cream, and walnut cakes filled with red bean. She ran a bubble gum selling business in middle school until it was shut down. She tried out for a Quidditch team, but didn't make the cut. Her family lore says that her grandfather lost part of his farm in a game of Go Stop. And she lives in New York City, but folks can tell she grew up in Texas by how often she, she says, y'all. It is my pleasure to introduce Erin Yoon. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Hi, everyone. Like she said, my name is Erin Yoon, and I'm the author of the middle grade book, Pip Park Raises Her Game. And I'm so excited to be here virtually to tell you all about my book today. But before I get into more about what my novel's about, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I actually became an author. So a lot of times kids will ask me how you become an author. And I think luck definitely plays a huge role. But if I had any specific advice to give y'all watching today, it would be this quote by Stephen King, which is, if you want to be a writer, you must do two things above all others. One, read a lot, and two, write a lot. So I think the second half of this quote, write a lot, makes intuitive sense to people. If you're a writer, you should write. But to me, that means taking a part of almost every day just to write something small. And you don't have to burn yourself out by working every day on a novel or even a short story. It could be as simple as transcribing a conversation you overheard your friends talking about on the Zoom call last night. Or maybe you write one paragraph about how amazing the pizza you had for dinner was last night. Or one paragraph about how terrible the pizza was you had for dinner last night. What you write isn't so important as the act of writing, because I think that really hones the muscles necessary to become an author. But at the same time, I think the first half of this quote, read a lot, makes even more sense to me. As a kid, my parents made sure that I read all the time. And I'm so grateful for that, because reading is what teaches you the skills necessary to become a writer. It will introduce you to new genres and new perspectives. Plus, when you're reading a book, you know when a character feels amazing and timeless, but you also know when a plot point kind of feels weak or uninspired. In other words, reading is what teaches you to become a writer. So now let me tell you a little bit about my own book, Pip Park Raises Her Game. Pip Park Raises Her Game is about a Korean American girl named Pippa who receives a mysterious basketball scholarship to her local private school and becomes determined to use this opportunity to reinvent herself both to impress her fancy new friends, as well as an impossibly cute crush on the side. It's a book about first crushes, the ups and downs of families, and new friendships. But above everything else, it's about one girl who, in trying to fit in, learns that maybe she's meant to stand out instead. So my book is actually what is known as a fractured classic. And for those of you who maybe haven't heard the term before, a fractured classic is basically just a retelling of a classic story. So you can actually think about it like a block of Legos, right? So when you're playing with Legos, you take the Lego pieces and build something like an airplane. And then you take apart those Lego pieces and build something entirely new, like a truck. You're still using those same Lego pieces, but at the same time, you're creating an entirely new shape. And that's at least my goal when I try to write a retelling. And I've always been a fan of retellings and more broadly, fractured classics. But I think this quote by Neil Gaiman sums up why I like them so much. And that's, we have the right and the obligation to tell old stories in our own ways, because they are our stories. Classic books are amazing because they have timeless themes and really interesting characters. But at the same time, we're all going to relate to those themes in our own personal, unique ways. And so retellings are really a way for you to let your own perspective shine through. So if any of that was confusing, let's look at a couple examples of retellings I'm sure you've either heard, seen, or watched before. So maybe some of you out there watching have heard of Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare before. So Romeo and Juliet, for those of you who haven't seen it, 
is about a young boy and a young girl who fall in love, but they come from fighting families who are trying to keep them apart, and they actually end up dying for this forbidden love. Now, even if you haven't seen Romeo and Juliet, I'm sure some of you have seen Romeo and Juliet before. And this is about red gnomes who are neighbors of these blue gnomes, and they're also fighting, but two of these young gnomes end up falling in love with each other, and it's a lot less bleak than the original because nobody dies. So you can see kind of some of the similarities there. But while the changes and similarities of Romeo and Juliet and Romeo and Juliet are pretty clear, did y'all know that High School Musical is also a retelling of Romeo and Juliet? For those of you who haven't seen High School Musical before, it's about a young academic girl who falls in love with this basketball jock and their friend groups try to keep them apart. But again, nobody dies in this version. And in fact, they end up bonding over the school musical. So you can see that it's a lot different from Romeo and Juliet than Romeo and Juliet, but both of these are retellings and they can be as close to the original as you want are as creative and far away. And hopefully some of those watching out there can actually think of your own retellings that you've seen from your personal life. I actually find that when you start to look for retellings, you'll find them everywhere. So it's really cool. Okay, so now that we know what a fractured classic and what a retelling is, let's talk about what kind of books can be retold. In general, books take inspiration from other books all the time. But if you're looking to retell a specific story, you have to make sure that it's not copyrighted. So maybe some of you out there have heard of the term copyright before, but for those of you who haven't, copyright laws help writers protect their book for a certain period of time. And that means if a book is copyrighted, the content of that book legally belongs to the author, and other people can't just use or copy that content without the author's permission. So that means no matter how much you like, say, Harry Potter, you can't just resell that for a bajillion dollars. And that also means you can't rewrite a book called Larry Potter and the Sword of Stone about a boy who goes to a place called Hogwarts because that would also be copyrighted and that would be plagiarism. And I'm sure some of your teachers have taught you what plagiarism is before, but just a refresher that plagiarism is when you copy somebody else's work without their permission, which you definitely can't do if it's copyrighted. Okay, but there are some stories that you can definitely retell, and those are books in the public domain. So what is the public domain, you might ask? Basically, when a copyright on a book expires, that book goes into the public domain. And there are a lot of weird, just bizarre rules about when exactly a book crosses over into the public domain, but if you ever have a specific story that you'd like to retell, you can just Google it to find out when it comes out, and that's the easiest way for me. In the upcoming years, there are tons of books coming into the public domain that I'm personally really excited about, but one of my favorites is actually The Great Gatsby, which enters the public domain in 2021, so I'm sure we'll see lots of really cool retellings about that soon. And I know the public domain and copyright can be a little bit dense and confusing, so if you have any questions about what makes a book go into the public domain or what makes something copyrighted, feel free to ask in the chat and afterwards I can get to those questions. Okay, so now let's talk about what makes my book, Pip Park Raises Her Game, a fractured classic. This is actually based off of a story by Charles Dickens called Great Expectations, which is a very, very old book about a young boy named Pip who receives help from a mysterious criminal stranger who gives him the money to become educated. And in a lot of ways, Pip Park has similarities to Great Expectations. Both books start out with a very mysterious stranger. In Great Expectation, Pip meets a criminal in the cemetery and the situation is very tense and spooky and he has no idea why the criminal is there or what's happening. But I won't spoil the book for you, but it does turn out to have a lot of involvement around this kind of mysterious criminal. And in Pip Park Raises Her Game, she meets a mysterious teenager in the woods. And he's not a criminal, but he is playing the violin in the rain of all places. And Pippa has no idea who he is and she's very, kind of intrigued by him, but also a little bit creeped out. And so um, that's also a very similarity. And they also share a very unfriendly love interest. So I don't know if any of y'all watching have ever had a crush before, but Pippa falls head over heels for her tutor, Elliot, who she just thinks is the cutest boy in the entire world. And even though he's actually a little bit cold and a jerk to her, she's determined to make him fall in love with her too. Both books also share themes of ambition and opportunity. Pippa's determined to become the world's best basketball player, and she won't let anyone stand in her way. And finally, another similarity is some of the family relationships in the book. So in Great Expectations, Pip's brother-in-law is a man named Joe, 
who's just the sweetest, most humble man you'd ever meet. And I liked the relationship so much that I copied it for my own book. So Pippa's brother-in-law is a man named Jean Qua, and he's also just the sweetest, nicest person you could hope to be for a brother-in-law. And he's always there to listen to Pippa or even give her a snack when she's feeling down. But at the same time, I think that a retelling should have lots of twists and turns of its own. So when I was writing the book, I made sure that I had its fair share of differences as well. And one of the biggest differences is that Pip is now Pippa, a spunky 12-year-old first-generation Korean-American girl with a passion for basketball. Another difference is that my book takes place in modern times, which not, may not sound like a big change at first, but Dickens definitely didn't have a cell phone and he definitely, definitely didn't have social media, both of which play a pretty big role in my own book. Another change is that unlike Pip, Pippa isn't an orphan. I thought having both of her parents be dead was a little bit too bleak for my book, so her mom is alive, she just lives in Korea. And finally, most of the third part is dramatically different. I find that when you're writing retelling, oftentimes the beginnings of the book start out pretty similar because you're feeling fresh, inspired, but as you get to know your own characters more, they actually start to make their own decisions, which actually takes the book in a wildly different direction than you might have been expecting originally. In addition to being inspired by great expectations, I also took a lot of inspiration from my own personal life. So I'm half Korean, and a lot of details from my own childhood made their way into Pippa's life as well, such as her favorite Korean dramas or her favorite food. I don't know if any of y'all watching out there have ever seen Boys Over Flowers before, but this used to be my absolute favorite drama back in eighth or ninth grade, and it's Pippa's favorite too. Back in the day, I actually had to illegally download it online, but now it's available on places like Hulu and Netflix, so it's actually really cool to see just how much more popular and accessible K-dramas have gotten in the US. In addition, me and Pippa have a lot of our favorite foods that we share in common. I don't know if y'all like spicy food, but if you do, you should definitely check out Dukboki. It's this dish of spicy, slightly sweet rice cakes with eggs and fish cakes, and they're just absolutely delicious. I'm craving it right now. And another thing that me and Pippa share in common is our favorite ice cream. I might be a little bit biased, but I think that Korea has some of the best ice cream in the world. So over here on the right, you can see my favorite watermelon popsicle. And if you have an H Mart near you, I would highly recommend driving there just to get these watermelon popsicles. I actually find that giving your characters just a little bit of your own favorite things is a really nice way to connect with them and just kind of get inspired when you're feeling down. And speaking of being inspired by your characters, are any of you out there actually writers? You can drop that in the chat if you are. And if you are writers, I'm sure that sometimes you get uninspired or stuck while you're writing a book. And so now I'm gonna share with you a few of my favorite tips for when I do get writer's block. So one of the tips I like to use is actually drawing or sketching my characters. On the left here, you can see an early sketch of Pippa from the outline stages. I know I'm not the best artist, but I really just like drawing my characters to get closer to them in my own mind. And I also like to make Spotify playlists of either songs I think they like, songs I think that describe them, or even just songs that describe a chapter that I'm working on. The reason I like these two tips is because while you're not writing, you're still doing something creative. You're either drawing or listening to music. And so when you go back to writing, you're still in that creative mindset. And I just feel really fresh, inspired whenever I do that. But personally, I think the tip that I use most often is actually taking personality quizzes for my characters. So if you go online and type in something like the Myers-Briggs test, it will take you to a personality quiz that asks you questions like, are you often late to events? And so I like to fill out these personality quizzes from the point of view of my characters. And so in Pippa's case, it'd be like, yes, I'm late all the time. And the reason I like to do this is because these personality quizzes ask you so many questions that maybe you might not have thought of before. And so they force you to examine multiple different angles from your character's point of view. So in a second, we're actually gonna talk more about point of view and then we're gonna work on our own retellings together. But first, I just wanted to walk you through the process of going from a first draft to a finished novel. I think it's important to remember that no book, okay, almost no book, is done after the first draft. First you write, and then you edit, and then you edit some more and a little more, and you get the picture, but it's a whole lot of editing. I think I wrote the first draft of Pippa in about two to three months but the editing phase lasted probably three to four times that long. So you can see that the editing phase takes way more than the writing phase. And to some that might sound a little bit scary, but to me it's actually really inspiring because oftentimes young writers will finish a book 
and then they'll read it and be like, well, this isn't as good as what I see on the shelves. But that's not your fault. It's because no book is ever as good until the editing phase. That's really what makes your book shine. So once you finish a first draft, you should be incredibly proud of yourself because not many people get that far. And then you should get to editing. Okay, so I'm sure some of your teachers have taught you about point of view before. For just a quick refresher, point of view is just a voice in which a story is told. So to figure out point of view, just ask yourself, who is telling the story? Is it a narrator who knows every detail about everyone? Or is it an individual like you or me who only knows what they experience? That will help you find out what point of view you're reading. And there are three different types of point of views. The first one we're gonna talk about is third person point of view. So third person point of view uses a narrator to tell the story. And you'll know it's third person because the narrator will use words like she, he, or they. Some of my all time favorite books are told in the third person. And so I wanted to read you a quote from one, from one of my favorite books, The Tale of Despero by Kate DiCamillo. The queen loves soup. She loves soup more than anything in the world, except for the princess pea and the king. And what soup it was. Cook's love and admiration for the queen and her palate moved the broth that she concocted from the level of mere food to a high art. And for those of you watching, you can see that what makes this third person is they're using she, right? So you can see she means third person. And if you have any questions about third person point of view or anything else, feel free again to drop them in the chat and I'll get to them at the end. So the second point of view that we're gonna talk about is second person point of view. And second person point of view features a narrator addressing a person from the you perspective. And you'll know it's second person because the narrator will use the word you. In fact, I'm talking to you in the second person right now. And this perspective is a lot more rare in stories, but it definitely exists, such as in Goosebumps' Choose Your Own Adventure books or in Kwame Alexander's book. Like lightning you strike, fast and free, legs zoom down field, eyes fixed in the checkered ball, on the goal 10 yards to go, can't nobody stop you, can't nobody cop you. Again, you can see that what makes this second person is the you. Okay, y'all are doing great. So now we're gonna move on to the last point of view, which is first person point of view. And first person point of view tells a story from the eyes of one of the characters inside the book. And you'll know it's first person because they'll use words like I, my, or me, or even we if it's plural. Both Great Expectations and Pippa Park Raises Your Game are written in the first person. Personally, I chose first person because I just love getting deeper into a character's personality and being able to really closely explore their minds. And so to me, that was just the natural choice. And so I'm gonna read you both actually of the lines from Great Expectations and Pippa Park so you can see two different examples of first person point of view. So the first quote is from Great Expectations. And that's, my father's family name being Parip, and my Christian name Philip. My infant tongue can make of both names nothing longer or more explicit than Pip. So you can see the my is what makes that first person. And then I'm gonna read you the first line of my own book. And that's, I was the only person in the park, tucking a damp strand of hair back behind one ear. I surveyed the abandoned slides and empty benches. So again, you can see that even though Pip Park uses the pronoun I and Great Expectations uses my, these are both examples of first person point of view. Okay, so now we're gonna actually work on our own retellings together. So for those of you watching along, you can actually go to my website, www.pinpark.com to download a worksheet that will help you create your own retelling. And the link should also be in the description of this event on Facebook if you're there. So if you wanna take a second to download that, it's totally fine. Otherwise, you can just get a piece of paper and a pencil if you wanna work along with me, or it's totally okay if you just listen and think of your ideas in your head. Anything is fine. So I'm gonna give you just like a couple seconds if you wanna grab a piece of paper and a pencil, but if not, that's totally fine as well. And then we're gonna work on our own retellings together. Okay. So the first step that I like to do when I'm creating a retelling is obviously I wanna pick a story to make a retelling about. So if you're working along with me, I want you to pick a story that you've read, heard, or seen, and you're gonna use this as a starting point for your own story. If it's a book in the public domain, and remember the public domain is just when books are old enough that the copyright no longer applies, then that's great. But right now, since we're just doing this as an exercise and for fun, and you're not trying to sell your story, it's also fine to choose a modern book that you know. So remember, if you're gonna sell your book, 
It has to be in the public domain, but if you just want to do it for fun, you can totally pick any book at all. And I'm going to work along with you, so I'm just going to pick a book that I know everybody has probably either heard of or read, which is Harry Potter. Okay, great. So the second step is you're going to think about why you like that story. Maybe it's a central conflict. You think those wizarding battles are just really epic and cool and you want to copy that for your own story. Or maybe you like the relationships between the characters. You think that the friendship that Ron, Harry, and Hermione have is just super wholesome and you like that. Or maybe you just really think Dobby is the cutest thing in the world and that's what you like about the story. You can pick literally any element in the world about what you like about your story. But I want you to jot a couple things down about what you like about that story. And then once you have what you like about the story, I like to think about how I can change those elements to tell the story that I want to tell. So how I can update those things. The third step when you're making a retelling is you want to brainstorm who the main character is and their personality and all these different traits about them. And don't worry, you don't have to pick Harry Potter as your main character if you're retelling Harry Potter. It doesn't have to be the main character at all, actually. For example, I don't know if any of you out there have seen the play Wicked, but Wicked is actually a retelling of the movie The Wizard of Oz, but it's told from the point of view of the Wicked Witch of the West and not Dorothy. So it's actually told from the villain's point of view. So maybe if you choose Harry Potter, you actually want to retell it from Voldemort's point of view. Or maybe you think that Hermione has a lot to say and so you want to choose her. Or again, maybe you just think Dobby is the cutest thing in the world and so you're going to tell it from Dobby's point of view. In fact, I've had people actually retell Harry Potter from Harry's broomstick before. So it could be anyone. You can get as creative as you like. But once you have your main character, you want to brainstorm their personality and all the different traits about them. So that could be anything from being like, they get really angry or they really like mint chocolate ice cream. So just writing any small details about them will help you connect to them more and really understand who they are and what they want. Okay, our almost final step is just to choose your point of view. So the point of view is about how you're going to tell your story. Before, we were thinking about what goes into your story, but this is more about the format. So if you really want to get inside your character's head, then maybe you want to consider first person, which is, again, I, my, or me. Or maybe you want your readers to have as much information as possible, so you think that you want to tell it in third person, he, she, or they. Or maybe you just really feel like a challenge, you want to do something interesting, and you choose second person as the you. Any of these are fine. I think all point of views are really cool, but just knowing why you choose a particular point of view is gonna be the most important thing here. And then after that, there's only one step left, and that's to actually write the first chapter of your story. And so I think that if you've been following along with me, your stories are gonna be really great, and so I'm really excited to hear about them. So if y'all are brainstorming along and wanna drop story ideas in the chat, I'd love to hear about them too. And then in a second, I'm actually gonna give you some information about how to email me or um, how to connect with me on my blog. But for now, I want to just go through a little bit of what we've learned today. So first, we learned what a fractured classic is, which is when you take a story and change it to tell a new story. Again, you can think of that like a block of Legos, where you start with one shape and then build an entirely new shape with the same Legos. Next, we talked about character development, which is finding ways to get inside a character's head. And I like to use three different tips, which was sketching my characters, creating Spotify playlists for them, and then taking personality quizzes for them. And finally, we talked about point of view, which is just telling the story from a particular perspective, either first person, second, or third person point of view. Okay, y'all have been great, and I'd love to hear any questions you have in a second, but again, you can visit www.pickwithpark.com to either download that worksheet or to find more activities and to read my blog. And you can also write a letter to me um, to Aaron, uh, to, uh, at Fabled Films Press by emailing info at fabledfilms.com. I'd love to hear any questions you have, if you have any additional ones after this. And again, a huge big shout out to um, Carroll County Library for hosting and A Likely Story. Y'all have been great. So if you have any questions now, I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much. That was excellent, Erin. Thank you so much for, for sharing uh, some of your, your writing secrets. Um, I really talk, liked how you talked about uh, the character's point of view, uh, especially the idea of Harry Potter being retold um, right. from the broomstick. The wand would also be interesting too, right? Yeah. 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 
Um, so we have some questions that came in. Um, this one's from Dolly. What draws you to a classic tale and how do you decide which ones you want to retell? Oh, that's a really good question, Dolly. You know, the first time I actually read Great Expectations was in high school and it's a little bit of a secret, but I actually remember not liking it much the first time I read it. And then I came back to it after college and the second time around, I actually found it so much more intriguing, especially I really liked the relationship between the main character, Pip, and his love interest, Estella, because a lot of books, I find that um, there's kind of like an instant romance where they fall in love immediately and everything's really happy. But this girl is actually really cold and kind of unfriendly to the main character. And I just found that really intriguing. So that's what drew me to this particular classic um, a lot. That was like the first thing that I really got attached to. But in terms of what stories you want to retell, I think it differs for every person. It's just finding maybe one element, either a character maybe that you really like, or just a theme, and then kind of running with it from there. And so it can be kind of random at times. <laughs> but that's what drew me to Great Expectations. Uh, this is a, a similar question on the same yeah. thing. Uh, you have a great connection and an appreciation for Korean culture. Uh, right. Is there any Korean classic that you would like to retell? You know, I think that's a very interesting question. When, for the first, about like, you know, up until high school, I actually had a hard time even finding Korean books because I don't speak Korean uh, fluently. So everything I read was either translations, um, you know, or like not a Korean American, you know, not like, so I don't really know that many Korean books particularly that I want to retell that would be old enough for me to retell like in the public domain. But I have to do more research on that. But there are a lot of Korean books I love and I can recommend you um, you know, some really cool Korean middle grade books that I particularly love, like Stand Up Yumi Chung is a great one by Jessica Kim. Um, and also Ellen O oh writes a lot of great uh, Korean middle grade books, such as uh, Spirit Hunters, if you really like something spooky. Uh, um, a lot of folks give advice about writing, uh, and you talked about the importance of editing. Could you offer any advice on how to be a good editor? Oh, that's a really great question. So I think the important thing about being a good editor is being willing to kind of compromise at times. So often when you're writing a book, you'll have an editor who works with you and they'll suggest changes. And it can be the hardest thing in the world to cut dialogue and to cut things that you really love that maybe don't add much to like the pacing of the book or the plot. And so you kind of have to learn to sacrifice some of the things that you like in order to make your book better as a whole. And so that's one thing I struggle with is I always want to keep everything in, but then my book would be like 500 pages. So to be a good editor, you have to be willing to let go of some of the things that you love. You talked about uh, adding some of the things you like to your characters. Yeah. At what point um, does adding the things you enjoy and your personality and preference become you're writing about yourself? <laughs> that is also a really good question. <laughs> I think the difference is making sure that you have a lot of differences as well. So me and Peppa share some similarities in terms of our like hobbies and interests, but in terms of personality traits, I would say she's a lot more stubborn and extroverted than I am. And compared to her, I feel like a little bit timid and scared sometimes. I really admire her boldness and her bravery. So I think that by adding traits that are opposite from you, as well as some of the things that are similar, you kind of find a good balance of having them not be as much of you as you like, you know, as it might be during the first draft or something like that. Uh, what about fairy tale retellings? Do you have a favorite? Oh, I love fairy tale retellings. Hmm. Well, you know, I do. Let me let me think. I do love the um, the retelling Grump. It's a retelling of Snow White, but it's from a dwarf's point of view. And I read that a couple months ago, so it's still kind of fresh in my brain. But I remember not really liking the original Snow White, but loving the retelling of this. So that um, really stands out in my mind. And uh, one final question here. Yeah. Um, what are you working on now? And is it a retelling or will we hear more about Pippa? Okay, well, it depends if y'all watching can kind of keep a little bit of a secret. So I'm going to assume that y'all can and tell you that I am working on a sequel to Pip Park right now. I can't tell you many details because it's still in the early stages, but um, that, that is something I'm really excited about right now. So I'm happy to be continuing about Pippa. <laughs> well, Erin, uh, we really loved Pippa here. We oh, were so, so excited that uh, you chose to spend some of your time with us this afternoon. Yeah.
afternoon. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, and we invite you back anytime and wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, everyone.